Hare Krishna. <coughs> okay. Om Ajnana Timarandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chaksurun Militanye Na Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Vanchaka Upata Rubyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhaihevacha Patitanam Pavan Ebyo Vaishnavibyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadha, Shri Vasati Gaur Bhaktavinda. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Rama Hare Hare. So we welcome everyone to our study of Bhakti Shastri. What happened here? Okay. Okay, Varnashram Dharma in the Bhagavad Gita, we're going to hear. What does Lord Krishna have to say about Varnashram Dharma in the Bhagavad Gita? Let's go ahead here. Review from Lesson 2. Identified Arjuna's first four reasons for not fighting. Who remembers the four reasons? Yes? Prahlad? Krishna Maharaj. Um, the first reason is um, compassion. Okay. Yes. And compassion. Second, enjoyment. Yes. Third, sinful reactions. Uh -huh. And fourth, destruction of the dynasty. Oh, good. Yes. Right. All right. And then we listed the progressive steps leading toward destruction of the dynasty. Would someone else like to tell us the different steps which lead to the destruction of the dynasty? Krishna Maharaj, um, the steps to destruction of dynasty, first one is death of the family elders, then eternal family tradition is vanquished, then family becomes involved in irreligion, then degradation of womanhood, then unwanted progeny, Varna, Varna Shankara, community projects and family welfare activities devastated. Oh, very good. Yes, right. Okay, so those were the different stages. And then we spoke about this statement, women are generally not very intelligent. And we said it may be appropriate in some cases, but devotee women are generally very intelligent. A woman is a devotee, she must be intelligent because she's come to Krishna consciousness. So that's a sign of intelligence. So we don't discriminate against all women, and women can also achieve the supreme perfection. All right, and then appropriate and inappropriate application of the utility of violence. 
so I was remembering uh, when we finished that uh, I, from different groups. One group, they said that uh, violence could be used and they quoted the six different reasons which are given in one purport where it mentions that you would be you could be considered justified to be violent. You know, things like if someone takes your wealth or if someone takes your wife or if someone sets fire to your home, different things like that. So that statement, that's actually said, that is from the Artha Shastra. But according to Dharma Shastra, violence is not allowed on, those, on that basis. According to Artha Shastra, you may be, somebody takes your wealth or takes your wife or like that, you may be able to kill them, but not according to Dharma Shastra. Dharma Shastras are on a higher level. So we have to understand anyway the utility of violence, that violence can be used in the service of Krishna, but it must be used with great caution. We should be very careful about trying to utilize violence in the service of Krishna. And just like anger, anger can also be used in the service of Krishna, but you should be a master of the, your mind and senses before you try to use anger in the service of Krishna. Otherwise, it will simply lead to your own degradation. So we have to be very cautious about utilizing things like anger and violence and so on in the service of Krishna. It's very, very uh, sensitive issue. And generally, devotees, we want to be non-violent. We don't encourage violence. We want to practice ahimsa, non-violence. But at the same time, we're not Buddhists. And the, for the Buddhists, non-violence is the highest principle of religion. But in Krishna consciousness, ahimsa is a, it's a sub-religious sub principle. It's not the ultimate principle of religion. So violence has its use. Just like a murderer should be hanged or killed by the state. And sometimes the state may also use violence to bring law and order into the state if there's a, a serious uh, problem with disruptions and protests, then the military may take action to bring about law and order. So in that way, there are cases where violence can be used. But again, it's, it's with great caution and it's like, it's a very last resort. All right? So I hope that's clear to everyone. Be cautious about this, about using violence. Okay, we're going ahead now. Principles of Varnashrama Dharma. Someone like to read? Hare Krishna Maharaj, a question, sorry, uh, for the last point you made. Okay, so, yeah. Um, yeah, so violence you explained. So there was a point uh, regarding terrorism in the name of religion. So what is your, um, you know, uh, final input regards to that? Uh, well, we don't support terrorism at all in the name of religion. We're, pe we're peaceful and our practice of religion. And we're tolerant as well. Even though, even though some governments may not be supportive, and they may even be objecting and they may try to suppress Krishna consciousness, but we're peaceful. We don't try to use, I mean, to to encourage terrorism, that is, that is not Krishna consciousness. That is not the Krishna conscious idea. Okay, thank you, Maharaj. That is religious fanaticism. So we, won't, we don't want to be fanatics. Okay. Thank you, Maharaj. All right, speaking now on Varnashram, someone please read this. Yes, Devanayani Madhavi, please 
in the system of the varnashrama in the system of the varnashrama institution there are many principles of religious traditions to help members of the family grow properly and attain spiritual values the varnashrama religion's principles were so designed that the good population would prevail in society for the general spiritual progress of state and community 1.39 uh, to 40 per point thank you very much yes so the system of varnashram is there within our religious tradition it's an important part of our religious tradition to help <coughs> the purpose being to help members of the family grow and attain spiritual values now we we, we say lord chaitanya uh he would he rejected varnashram when it was suggested by ramananda rai well he didn't reject it but he said this is external he lord chaitanya had asked ramananda rai to explain about what is to give some verses to support the highest principle of religion and so ramanan ramananda rai first of all gave a verse from the scriptures which explained the importance of varnashram and said that if we follow varnashram that is the perfection of religion but lord chaitanya said well that is external and lord chaitanya wanted to speak about devotional service but at the same time lord chaitanya followed varnashram very strictly he was a very strict grihastha and he was a very strict sanyasi so lord chaitanya strictly followed varnashram so prabhupad explains here the purpose of the varnashram that it is designed in such a way that good population would prevail that's very important part of society we we speak a lot about the need for good population when you get good population then it's very easy for spiritual progress both in the state and in the community so both in the, the the individual and in the mass scale if you get good population if everyone if the po whole population is varna sankara then it's very difficult you don't get such good population if it's all varna sankara then the karma is very great and it makes it very difficult for people to progress so varnashram dharma is a system given by lord krishna to organize society for the good of the of the population okay we're going to discuss all of these different points about varnashram five different principles first of all we will define what is varnashram then we will explain explain about the modes how they influence the different varnas we want to explain about the duties of each varna and ashram and the resu the result of following varnashram so there are two different kinds of duties in varnasha we have occupational duties and prescribed duties occupational duties and prescribed duties so there's swadharma and swakarma swakarma being one's own duty and swadharma being one's own religious principle so swakarma is that will be things like taking care of our family you have a family we have a duty to take care of them it's a duty 
and Swadharma our own religious principles. That will be things like chanting the holy name, worshipping Krishna, eating prasadam, reading scriptures. All right, so two different kinds of uh, occupation. You have occupational duties, occupational duties, some according to your varna, you have occupation, and prescribed duties, prescribed duties, according to your social situation, you have prescribed duties. And then we see also Kula Dharma, Jati Dharma, Jati Dharma, the community projects, Jati, Jati Brahmins, we speak about Jati Brahmins, Brahmin by birth, born in that kind of Brahmin family. So Jati Dharma, community projects, someone's born in a particular community, they'll have different projects. And Kula Dharma, the family traditions, different families, some families you'll see they perform different pujas like some families they often go to Tirupati, go to Balaji for the child to shave the head, like that, it's the family tradition. Sometimes the family will all go, the whole family will go and everyone will shave their heads, it's a tradition. So Kula Dharma, family tradition. But Kula Dharma, they may be Vaishnava. They say, we are Vaishnava. Our family is Vaishnava. <laughs> Actually, you're not, you cannot be Vaishnava by birth. But they, they say it like that. It's a family tradition. Kula Dharma. From Prabhupada's purport in the second chapter, text 31, Prabhupada has written, Human civilization begins from the stage of Varnashram Dharma are specific duties in terms of the specific modes of nature of the body obtained. So that the beginning of human civilization is it's human civilization to be organized and to designate people in particular duties particular occupations according to their nature. Everyone has different psychophysical natures. Arjuna, for example, as a Kshatriya, he has his psychophysical nature, very powerful, very strong, very courageous, at the same time very religious and pious. And someone else is a Brahman, they're an intellectual, they like to study, they like to worship the deity, they are absorbed in contemplating the Supreme. Brahminical culture, inclined to cleanliness, and they're gentle in behavior. Born, they're always truthful. They won't lie, they won't hide the truth. And the Vaishya will be businesslike. And the Sudra is the worker. He's told what to do. So the modes influence these different varnas. From Bhagavad Gita, this verse is there, Chatur Varnam Maya Shristam Guna Karma Vibhagasha. Right? Lord Krishna is describing that. The four varnas, chatur varna, maya shristam, he said, I created them. So the people sometimes they criticize the system of dividing society, but we should understand it's the creation of the Lord himself. And he created it according to guna and karma, not according to janma and karma, but guna and karma. So birth is not the deciding factor, but it's guna and karma which decides one's position in the different varnas, according to one's quality and work. If someone's a brahmana, 
then they not only should have the qualities of the brahmana, but they should work like a brahmana. So these different designations are there. According to the three modes of material nature and the work associated with them, the four divisions of human society are created by me. Chapter 4, text number 13. So we often have to quote this verse that somebody is identified with a partic particular varna not by birth. Although birth itself is an advantage, but it's not the deciding factor. Certainly birth in a brahmana family is a great advantage to becoming a brahmana, but still you have to cultivate the qualities and you have to work like the brahmana. It's not simply birth alone. And that, of course, brought about the failure of the Varnashram system because everything was based on birth. So people didn't follow. Uh, people became proud. Somebody became proud. I'm a good Brahmin, you know. And someone else is Sudra by birth. And so they're looked down on. And this, of course, this uh, problem led to the um, appearance of Buddhism. Because Buddhism led people away from the Vedas. Prior to Lord Buddha, the Brahmanas were in power. And the, nobody else could read the Vedas. Only the Brahmanas can recite the Vedas. And so the people would have to go to the Brahmanas and, and the Brahmanas then also became corrupt and degraded. So because of corruption and degradation, the whole system fell apart. And the result was Buddhism came about and they led people away from the Vedas. They led people away from the Vedas. And it was Shankaracharya who brought back the Vedas again, defeated Buddhism and, and brought back strict following of Brahminical culture. He brought, he brought back a very high standard in Brahminical culture. So that was very good and that helped the, the Vedic culture to come back again. Although for, for a long time, Buddhism had become prep all over India. And it was so common in India that even Mathura, which was the birthplace of Lord Krishna, Mathura became the Buddhist capital. And you can go today to the museum in Mathura and you will see so many Buddhas are there. And they're relics from the time when Buddhism was all over Mathura and prominent all over India. But it was Shankaracharya who brought back the Vedic culture and then the Vaishnavas established the proper understanding of Vedic culture. Okay, so the, the four divisions of human society were the divine creation, creation by the Lord himself. It's a perfect system, but it has to be followed properly. It must be followed based on qualities and work, not simply only by birth. All right, so here we see the different modes, how the modes influence. The Brahmana should be a symbol of the mode of goodness, the different qualities of the Brahmana, which are described in the 18th chapter. And the Kshatriyas, they're the influence of their generally influenced by Rajagun, passion, power. And the Vaishyas are a combination of Rajas and Tamas, and the Sudras are considered influenced by Tamagun. The Sudra's nature is just to be told to do everything. He has to be told, do this, do that, take this, take that, go there, come here. So they don't have really initiative to work on their own. So this is the nature of the sudra. And so they, they're influenced by the tamagun. Okay. 
And then the specific duties of the brahmana. Here you see the nine qualities of the brahmana. <coughs> so the brahmana is, of course, the, like the head of the social body. The four different varnas represent different parts of the social body. Each of the four parts are important. For particularly in the body, you must have a head. If there's no head in the social body, then the body will be a dead body. We cut off the head is to kill the person. And similarly, if there's no head in the social body, in a society, then it's a dead society. So the position of the brahmanas are very important in, this, in the Vedic culture. But to be a brahmana, you, you're expected to cultivate these nine qualities. Very important, particularly uh, purity and honesty. Purity, meaning that if a brahmana sees a dirty place, he must clean it. He cannot leave it dirty. If one is actually a brahmana, he must clean it. Prabhupada made this point to us several times. Uh, there was one time here in Mayapur. Uh, Prabhupada, when he would come to Mayapur, he would, off, he would like to go around the grounds and he would inspect the grounds all over Mayapur. And he would inspect also the, the toilets and can have a look at the conditions and see that we were keeping everything neat and clean. So Prabhupada, I remember one time Prabhupada came and at that time we, devotees were living along the wall. You know, nowadays we have shops there along the wall, but we didn't have a lot of accommodation for the devotees. So many devotees were living along the wall and there was toilets, there was a, an outhouse, a circular building which had a lot of toilets there. So Prabhupada was going around and he came to this toilet area and he opened the door and he looked inside and he saw it was all dirty and he was upset, very angry. He said, he said, you are brahmanas. He said, you, can't, you cannot say, I never made the mess. If a brahmana sees a place dirty, he must clean it. He cannot just simply leave it. And Prabhupada had studied chemistry as a young man. And he gave an example. Many of you, if you've studied chemistry, you must know the basic chemical equation. It says, a base plus an acid will give salt plus water. A base means like sodium hydroxide plus hydrochloric acid, and then you get salt, sodium chloride plus water. It's a very basic chemical equation. So Prabhupada studied chemistry and he gave this example. He said, in the same way, a brahmana, when he contacts a dirty place, he must clean it. He cannot leave it dirty. This is very important. And then also honesty. The brahmana is truthful. And Prabhupada would tell, of, there's that well-known story about the young boy who wanted to be admitted into the school. And so the head teacher was interviewing him and he asked him, who is your father? What's your father's name? So the boy said, oh, I don't know, I have to go and ask my mother. So he went home and asked his mother, what was his father's name? And the mother told him, she said, I don't know. I don't know the name of your father. So the young boy came back and he told the head teacher, my mother did not know the name of my father. So the head teacher said, oh, all right, you, you can be admitted. The head teacher understood this boy is truthful. Now someone else in that situation, they may lie, they may feel embarrassed, they may feel ashamed, oh my mother didn't know the name of my father, how embarrassing, I'll just make up a name, I'll just tell them my father's name. But this boy just told the truth. So the teacher appreciated the honesty 
of the boy. He saw this boy, is, he has Brahminical qualities. He doesn't lie. So it's a very good quality. So these qualities, of course, for a Brahmin, they're very important. We should try to cultivate them. And becoming a Brahmin, of course, is not perfection. We have to go on from the, Brahmi, from the Brahminical platform to become Vaishnava. That's the idea. From the Brahminical platform, then we go on further to become Vaishnava. So, Brahmana means these qualities, nine qualities. Peacefulness, self-control, austerity, purity, tolerance, honesty, knowledge, wisdom, and religiousness. So, we should be cultivating these qualities. Of course, in the, by practicing Krishna consciousness, taking part in the regular program of worshipping and hearing and chanting, then naturally we will develop these qualities. So this is the duty of the Brahman. And then Kshatriya, we see seven qualities of the Kshatriya here. And the Kshatriya is like the arms in the social body. They have to give protection. They have to, at the same time, they have to be very generous. And they have this Ishwara Bhav. They have that uh, Ishwara Bhav, controlling, the power to control. And they will speak forcefully. Just like Arjuna, he went with Lord Krishna and Bhima they went to see Jarasandha and they were disguised as Brahmanas. But when they were speaking, Jarasandha could understand these people cannot be Brahmanas because they speak so powerfully. Their voices were like thunder. <laughs> you know, they, they have that power to control others by their speaking. So they have courage and they're very generous, like Maharaj Janak would give so much charity that everyone would get charity from him. And courage in battle, we'll hear more about that in the future, courage of the Kshatriya, how they want to die on the battlefield. They won't die going home or defeated. They want to die on the battlefield. And then the Vaishya's duty, Krishi Goraksha Vaninam Vaishya Karma Svabhavajam. The Vaishya's do farming, cow protection and business. Goraksha, protect the cows. Farming, Krishi Goraksha Vaninam and business, they do business. So Lord Krishna himself came in the family of Nanda Maharaj and they were Vaishyas and they were taking care of the cows and at the same time Lord Balaram, he was carrying the plough. So they would do farming, and protect the cows. This is the real business of the Vaishya. Very important. Uh, the most pious profession. Prabhupada describes farming. It's the most pious profession. Work in a factory, work in a multinational corporation, not very pious. But if you work in farming and taking care of the cows, that's the most pious profession. Very fortunate. Okay, and then the sudras, they give labor and service to others. So this is the duties of the different varnas. The specific duties of the ashrams, just as we have four varnas, we have also four ashrams. So the duty of the sannyasi is mentioned there in the 16th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita. Sannyasis should be fearless. We know Srila Prabhupada could go to America. He went without money and without knowing anyone. You have to be very brave to do that, particularly 
Srila Prabhupada did it at the age of 70. So very difficult to go there in a foreign country and with no money and not knowing people. But Prabhupada doesn't, he's not afraid. He, pure devotees, they, they're not, they don't have fear. Sannyasis don't worry like that. They're detached. And at the same time, they will purify their existence and cultivate spiritual knowledge. So this is the duties of the sannyas ashram. And then Nirvana Prastha, they will do austerity. The retired ashram, Vana Prastha, from Grihastha moved to Vana Prastha, retired. Uh, the statement is Pancha Sorvam Vanam Brajit. From the age of 50, one should go to live in the forest. So, the Vana Prastha, their duty is to do austerity. Uh, in the Kali Yuga, however, Prabhupada said, you cannot go to the forest. Forests are practically destroyed. He said, but you can go to the Krishna consciousness movement. And so, Vanaprastas, they should take shelter of the Krishna Conscious Center and go and live there and do service there. And that is their tapasya. And this is necessary because this is the preparation for the next life. The Vanaprastha, retired life is necessary. You don't retire from spiritual duties, but you, you should retire from material duties. And we should continue our spiritual duties as a preparation for the next life. So this is the idea behind the Vana Prastha system. The Grihastha Ashram, they have the duty to practice things like charity, self-control and sacrifice. Grihastha's, it's an ashram. In other words, it's a position for spiritual advancement. Grihastha life is not meant simply for uncontrolled sense gratification. Sometimes people wrongly think that because I'm a Grihastha, so I don't wake up in the morning and I don't have to control my senses, I'm a, I'm a Grihastha. That's not Grihastha, that's Grihamedi. If you don't wake up in the morning and you, you don't control your mind and senses, then you're Grihamedi. You're simply an envious person and you're not making spiritual. But the Grihastha can make spiritual advancement. And we see many, many advanced devotees are Grihasthas. Of course, most, most of the world are in householder life. So it's the duty of our devotees to show them the example of ideal householder life as Grihasthas. And as Grihasthas, they should practice like this, self-control and sacrifice and charity. You may say charity, how to give charity? We can give the holy name. It's not that charity means you have to give wealth. Not everybody has wealth. Especially in family life, you have a family to support and it's not easy to maintain families. There's a lot of responsibility, and a lot of expenses involved there. So how to give charity? We can give the holy name. The chanting of the holy name is the act of the greatest charity. And we encourage the Grihastas to do that, to give the holy name. And then brahmacharya, brahmacharis, the, this means the student stage of life. In the student stage of life, we, the devotee should study the Vedas, swadhyayas. You should practice studying the Vedas, reciting mantras, controlling the mind and senses. And then he can go on from brahmachari life, he can go on into grihastha life. Brahmachari life is a good preparation for family life. It is said actually to be a, a good householder, the man should be trained in brahmacharya life. And the woman, she should be trained in chastity. 
so brahmachari life the, that training is involved studying the vedas reciting vedic hymns worshiping the deities and living simply controlling the mind and senses living under the direction of the spiritual teacher and then the result of following varnashram dharma described in text number 31 of the second chapter discharging one specific duty in any field of action in accordance with the orders of higher authorities serves to elevate one to a higher status of life so that's the result of following varnashram you can be elevated to a higher status of life you want to go on come to the Brahminical platform and then from Brahminical platform you want to go on and become Vaishnava and then we quote from the 32nd chap 32nd sloka of the second chapter Swarga Dwaram Apavritam opening the doors of the heavenly planets this is the result following Varnashra will open the doors into the higher planet Of course, we, as devotees, we're not interested to go to heaven. But in the material platform, many people are, and presented here in the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna explains to Arjuna how fighting in the battle, doing his duty, will open the doors to the heavenly planets. In other words, it's a type of karmakanda which is being explained, that you do your duty, you go to heaven. We hope, as devotees, we're not att attracted to go to heaven. Rather, we want to go beyond the, the heavenly planets, far beyond the heavenly planets. We want to go out of the material world, into the spiritual world. That's the real goal, what we want to achieve. So, following Varnashram is a preparation to come to these higher levels. Someone could read this for me, please. Yes, Madhavan Prabhu. Krishna Maharaj. Whoever executes his occupational duty, Swadharma, for 100 births, for instance, if a Brahmana continues to act as a Brahmana, becomes eligible for promotion to Brahmaloka, the planet where Lord Brahma lives. Keep, oh, okay. That's Srimad Bhagavatam 4, 24, 29, purport. <coughs> so, you can see the standard. We have to perform our occupational duty, not just one birth, but for 100 births. So, <laughs> taking birth as a Brahmin at 100 births, and then you become eligible for promotion to Brahma Loka which is still in the material world. And Brahma Loka is not the spiritual world. It's the topmost planet in the material realm. So you're still there in the material world. There's still birth and death. So this is the results of following Varnashram. We can be elevated to a higher standard. All right, so we spoke about the definition of Varnashram Dharma, that it's a method of properly dividing society according to the psychophysical nature of different individuals. Everyone should work according to the nature uh, in terms of spiritual duties and occupational duties. So Varna and Ashrama. The explanation of Varnashram Dharma that we explained the two different duties there. We have occupational duties according to, and we have spiritual duties. So we have Swadharma and we have Swakarma. Religious duties and our own occupational duties, things we have to perform. We explained about the modes 
influencing the different varnas. And we just explained also the duties of the varnas and ashrams. And each of the varnas and ashram, there are different duties. Uh, and now Prabhupada explains that although we may not have varnashram actually established around the world, we do find in every society, everywhere we look in the world, you'll find there's, a, there's the intellectual class of people, there's the administrative class of people, there are the mercantile class of people or the business kind, kind of people, and then you have the workers. So everywhere there's four different varnas. It's there all over the world, the four varnas. It, it's the nature of the society. We, we don't label them as Brahman, Kshatriya, Vaishya, Sudra, but these four different kinds of duties are there all over the world. The intellectual, the administrative, the mercantile, and the worker or the laborer. So, this is the arrangement of the Lord. Oh, sometimes devotees ask Prabhupada, should we label people as Brahman, Kshatriya, Vaishya, Sudra? Srila Prabhupada said, no. He said, in our, in our Krishna consciousness movement, everyone is devotee. And devotees, they, will, they can do everything. They may be Brahmins, they may be Kshatriya, they may be Vaishya, and may be Sudra. They'll do whatever is required for the service of Krishna. That is important. <coughs> All right? So these are the principles of Vanashram. And we spoke about the result of following Vanashram. You'll be elevated to a higher standard higher position of life. Okay, coming back now, we're going to hear about the four reasons for not fighting. We heard Arjuna's four reasons in the previous class, in the smart, and today also, this afternoon, we were told the four reasons. Now we're going to look at how Lord Krishna defeats these different arguments. Arjuna gave these reasons and we've mentioned the different verses where Arjuna gave these reasons. The destruction of the dynasty, the sinful reactions, enjoyment. Arjuna said, I won't enjoy compassion. Arjuna's feeling no compassion. If I fight, it's not, there's no compassion. So these were Arjuna's four reasons for not fighting. And Lord Krishna is going to defeat each of these four reasons and we want to see how he does it as a perfect teacher. Yes, someone read? Yes, you want to Yes, read O son of Partha, do not yield to this degrading <coughs> importance. It does not become you. It does not become you. Give up such petty weaknesses of heart and arise, O chestier of the enemy. Bhagavad Gita 2.3. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. So, Lord Krishna was hearing from Arjuna his reasons why he did not want to fight. Lord Krishna, is, however, is not very impressed. And he's speaking to Arjuna, he's telling Arjuna, don't yield to this degrading impotence. Hmm. Hmm. Give up such petty weakness of heart, 
retired durbhoyam, retired durbhoyam, there is the weakness of the heart. And, he, and then he tells Arjuna, arise, O chastiser of the enemy. And so Lord Krishna is not telling Arjuna, oh, these are wonderful, Arjuna, it's so wonderful, you don't want to fight, you have so many good reasons. No, Krishna said, no, what is this? What kind of, what are you talking about, Arjuna? Don't give, don't become a victim of this kind of thinking. You know, we also, often in the same position, we're faced with a challenging situation and we'll, you know, we'll try to find reasons why I shouldn't do it. Uh, I remember one time, you know, I was a, I was a new devotee and they wanted me to cook the breakfast and they wanted me to cook this big pot of sweet rice. And I said, oh, I'm afraid. I said, what if I burn it? I thought, if I burn it, it will, it will taste horrible and everybody will be angry at me. And I said, oh no, I don't want to do it because I may burn it. And then everyone will be angry at me and they'll blame me. I burned the breakfast. <laughs> So that was my that was my weakness of heart, you see, and the person in charge of the kitchen. You are in Maya, Prabhu. What is this? Why you speak like this? You are in Maya. <laughs> so yeah, similarly, Lord Krishna is speaking to Arjuna about this Ridaya Durbalyam, the weakness of heart, degrading impotent. Mm. So he wants Arjuna give up that kind of mood. Fight. Fighting, very important. We have to have that. Arjuna's Kshatriya, right? So the quality of the Kshatriya should be courageous in battle. All right. Prabhupada explains. Yes, someone can read. Uh, Hare Krishna, <coughs> Bhishma Shudana, you killed Demon, you killed Demon Madhu, therefore your name is Madhusudana, but you are asking me to kill my grandfather and teacher. This is the hint, that is all right, that your name is Madhusudana. You killed one demon whose name was Madhu, but you are asking me, Bhishma Shudana, Bhishma is my grandfather. And Drona, and Drona Sudhana, Sudhana means killer. So how can I be that? Bhagavad Gita 2.1 to 10. Yes, this is Prabhupada explaining Arjuna's argument to Lord Krishna. Lord Krishna is telling him he should fight. But Arjuna is saying, huh, I should fight? You want me to kill my grandfather, my teacher? <laughs> and then, and then he says, Ma, your, your name is Madhu Sudana, but that's glorious. You killed the demon Madhu, but you want me to be Bhishma Sudana or Drona Sudana. That's not good. If I kill my own grandfather, my own teacher, you killed a demon, but they're not demons, Bhishma, Drona, so I'll get a bad name. You want me to do that? <laughs> Very good argument, actually, of course. And so Arjuna, replying to Krishna's challenge, Krishna wants to stir up the mind of Arjuna. So, one more reason why Arjuna didn't want to fight. The fifth objection, indecision. Arjuna is feeling that, oh, I don't know. Oh, I just don't know what to do. Yeah. Are you ever in that position? Of course, all of us sometimes. Oh, I don't know. I, what should I do? Is it right or wrong? So Arjuna has this dilemma to decide what to do. It's a big subject matter. Making decisions. Sometimes very difficult. 
But Arjuna is very fortunate. Why is he so fortunate? What's a good fortune for Arjuna? Why is Arjuna fortunate? Because Krishna is uh, with him. Yes, right. Exactly. He has Lord Krishna with him. So he can approach Krishna. So this is verse number six of the second chapter. Nor do we know which is better, conquering them or being conquered by them. Is it better to conquer them? Before we go, are they, maybe we should just let them conquer us. Arjuna has to decide what's right, what should we do? So he's a dilemma. And then we come to this wonderful verse, number seven in this chapter. Of course, this is one of your memorization verses. Those, right? You're taking the Bhakti Shastri course and you have to memorize a number of different slokas from Bhagavad Gita. And this is a very important verse because it's at, it's at this point that Arjuna has going to surrender to Krishna. And it means he's ready to hear from Krishna. Krishna was, had told him a little bit. He told him, you know, you're, oh, you're, you, this is my miserly weakness. Give up this tendency. But now when Arjuna actually surrenders to Krishna, then Krishna will really come in and he'll start instructing and guiding Arjuna. Krishna's been a bit quiet. He hasn't really broken into Arjuna's thinking yet. He's waiting. He's been waiting for this point, for Arjuna to actually to surrender. And sometimes, you know, in the course of our own life, we get points, you know, people may come to you and, you know, they ask for guidance. They want help. They really understand they have problems and they need help to overcome the difficulties. So they come and ask, can you help, can you help? what should I do? What do you think I should do? And so here also Arjuna is surrendering to Krishna. So let me hear you all recite this verse. Everyone together. God <laughs> All right. Karpanya. Karpanya meaning what? Miserly. Miserly, right? Right? Miserly. And what do we say? You say conjus, is it in Hindi or something? <laughs> yes, yes ma'am. Yes, right. So karpanya. Miserly. And Prabhupada talks about people being miserly. In what sense is Arjuna being miserly? Why is Arjuna miserly? Because he's thinking. Oh, sorry. Because he's not able to decide indecisiveness. No, because he, he's, he's, he's acting on bodily, 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 bodily concern. Yeah, body, not soul. Right, because he, that's, he's attached to the body. He's not making proper use of the human form of life, right? Prabhupada in the purport explains in some detail about the, the, the miserly person, just like a miserly person, he has money. He has money, what does he do with it? Maybe he counts it and he smells it <laughs> and then he plays with it, you know, but he doesn't spend it. And so that, that is miserly. So Arjuna, 
has a human form of life. Now the human form of life is special because the human form of life is meant to be used for the service of Krishna. It's meant to be used for spiritual advancement, to make spiritual progress, but Arjuna is he's not doing that. He's not taking advantage of the human form of life. So it's, uh, this is miserly. And this is dosha, dosha fault, right? You have a fault it's because of my miserly weakness. So this is his dosha, yeah, fault. Sometimes people, you know, they have their astrological charts and they will have some dosha there. Oh, I have a, a this is a dosha, I have a fault there. Some bad qualities there sometimes. So Arjuna's fault is this miserliness, swabhava, his own nature, prichami tvam dharma samuda cheta. Dharma samuda cheta. That he's become bewildered about what is his actual real duty. Confused about his duty. This is the problem. He understands, he says, I'm confused about my duty, indecision. So he, he knows he's confused, but he's fortunate because he's coming to Krishna. Mm. So he's coming and he's saying, Shishyastiham sadimam tvam prapanam, that I'm coming to surrender to you. I want you to guide me. Uh-huh. And here's the translation. Now I'm confused about my duty and have lost all composure because of miserly weakness. In this condition, I'm asking you to tell me for certain what is best for me. Now I'm your disciple and a soul surrendered unto you. Please instruct me. All right, so this is the very important verse, very important point, actually the beginning of uh, Krishna's instruction to Arjuna. See, Dharma Samudha Cheta, right? We said Dharma. I am confused about my duty. Don't know what should be done. So, Shishastiham, I'm come to you. I want to be your disciple. So this is Arjuna come to this position, a very important point, and he's asking Lord Krishna, give me instruction. So questions for you. We want to have a little group exercise, give you a chance to think more about this situation. We want you to identify the general principles drawn from Arjuna's dilemma and surrender to Krishna. And then try to relate these principles, how they are relevant to your own practice of Krishna consciousness. All right? So how many people do we have here today? We have 49 miles. 49. Okay. So then we'll have like groups of, groups of five, and they will have ten groups, five people in each group. Yes? Are we lost, Prabhu? Yeah, we got uh, five groups now. Um, we want to keep it for how many minutes, Maharaj? Uh, well, at least ten minutes. Okay. Ten minutes, please. Yeah, give ten minutes to just because you have to read through the purport. And you have to identify the principles drawn from Arjuna's dilemma. What was it? What were the principles which brought about Arjuna's surrender to Krishna? Is it clear, everyone? Yes, yes, ma'am. So how many groups have you? How many groups have you made, Prabhu? Uh, we have uh, five groups. 
So what actually caused this? What brought on this Arjuna? Because Arjuna, remember, Arjuna had a friendly relationship with Krishna. But even Lord Krishna had come there as his chariot driver, subordinate to Arjuna. And he's taking orders. We heard Arjuna order Krishna, bring my chariot. And now Arjuna is saying, I am your disciple, a soul surrendered to you. So what happened? What was the actual Arjuna? Was, he was in this dil dilemma, but somehow he's... So can you consider? Do you have a question? Hare Krishna, yeah, actually I, I got the answer. I was a little confused with the first question, but I got it. Okay, good. Thank you. All right, so you meet with the group. So let everyone go in the groups and we'll see. Yeah, okay. Maharaj, there is a question in the chat. Is it 2.7 that we have to refer? Uh, Purport 2.7, Bhagavad Gita 2.7. Yes, right. Okay. Recording in progress. Recorded. Hello. Hello. <laughs> yes, Mataji, what are you saying? Okay, so I got the, the two points, right? Because uh, of this misprogram. And the problem, he thinks of the problem okay. as the body, not the soul. Uh, Hare Krishna. Hare I Hare think we are not in any group now. Yeah, we are out of group. Yeah. Yeah. Group, so close. group 10. Uh, no, uh, I hello, 48 parts. Just, uh, just everyone, yeah, just, just, just a second, devotee, just, just mute yourself. Yeah, yeah. Just, just give, give us one minute, yeah?
Oh, you're not in any group, is it? Not yet, Mara. I think there's some um, technical issue that you won't just come out of the group. So, Kavita Prabhu is doing again. Oh, okay. I was in group 9, but I don't know where I disappeared. I went to another group and came back. Yes, yes, Mark, I think, yes, he is, he is doing it again. <laughs> Just give you. us a two, two, three minutes, yes. Hare Krishna Maharaj I think we are in room 4 and you are also participating in that room. Okay. Nice to have your association. It's our pleasure, Prabhu. Uh, but I, I, we are not sure. I mean, how you are in this group. So, so have you understood the question all right? Uh, yes, Prabhu I mean... Uh, as for my understanding, we need to find the reasons why, uh, in for first question, we need to find the reason why Arjun just uh, suddenly found that he can be disciple of uh, Krishna and uh, uh, he should surrender unto Lord Krishna, yeah. not as... Uh, yes, you're right. Yeah. Why did you surrender to Krishna? Who else is in the group here? Uh, Hare Krishna, Dhanavat Maharaj. Yes, Hare Krishna. I, I am in group. I am in group four. As soon as the last. Okay. Hare Krishna Prabhu. So, have you come up with any principles? Hare Sunanda Prabhu, have you got any principles that you think why Arjuna surrendered to Krishna? Uh, Arjuna surrendered to Krishna because of his indecision, indecisive capacity and uh, he cannot, uh, he is very fearful. Uh, he, he is, uh, because Krishna is present, with him in the battlefield, so he he uh, saw that no nobody can solve his problem except Krishna. Oh. So he surrendered to Krishna. Why do you think Arjuna had so much faith? Krishna that Arjuna had so much faith in Krishna that he thought only Krishna can solve his problem, nobody else. Because uh, Krishna and Arjuna, the relationship is uh, uh, it's a friend, friendly relation, and uh, uh, Arjuna find that uh, Arjuna found that uh, Krishna is the only uh, only person, supreme person, he can solve his problem. Because uh, at that time, everybody in the battlefield they they stood up as an enemy, but Krishna. Uh, he stand, stood with uh, Arjuna with a, with a friend and uh, uh, we are missing friend. So he understood that only Krishna can solve his problem. Okay. Yes. Arjuna and Krishna had a long-standing friendship. 
And they often used to meet, yes. they often used to meet together and they would discuss philosophy. Right. So, so Arjuna had some faith in Krishna. And we also see that we just mentioned how Arjuna had described Krishna as Madhusudan. So he understood something about Lord Krishna's position. He understood that previously Krishna had killed this demon Madhu. So Arjuna was certainly in some knowledge about the yes. position of Lord Krishna. Oh. Uh, Hare Krishna Prabhuji, I, yes. uh, according to my understanding, uh, uh, Krishna, uh, Lord Krishna was giving a, every justification of his uh, re reason of uh, not to fight. Like when he was asking, he was he was saying uh, out of compassion we should not be uh, kill these people and uh, or we should not uh, there will be other reasons uh, of, of fighting uh, after fighting consequences will be there so Krishna was giving every justification to uh, his reason not to fight so he found that uh, Krishna is the only uh, uh, he has all the answers of his. Uh, reasons and justification of reasons so he can uh, guide him well so he surrender unto him. Yeah, how did he know Krishna could guide him well though? Because he, he uh, whenever he, he was, he has uh, raised a reason like uh, we should not be, uh, we should not fight with them. Uh, so he said, okay, this is, uh, this could be, Um, okay, I'm not able to explain, sorry, uh, I'll let me... Uh, Hare Krishna Prabhu, my understanding is uh, Arjuna was in, uh, he was perplexed, he don't know how to, what to do, how, what decision he is supposed to take. Uh, and between him and uh, Krishna, the relationship was uh, a friendly manner. So normally when we uh, talk with our friend, if our friend advises that we won't take it much seriously. We will be like, okay, it's up to us whether we need to do or no. But uh, Arjuna surrenders to Krishna and accepts him in a guru position and so that he would be able to um, accept what Krishna is telling. Yes, if he, makes, if he accepts him as a guru, then it's easier for him to accept what he's saying. But why would he accept Krishna as the guru? You know, just, you know, just because, oh, I, okay, I want to accept what you say, so I'll make you guru. <laughs> well, there has to be a bit more justification than this. You're going to accept someone as a guru. It's not just because you want to accept what they say, so you make them your guru. No? So why would Arjuna accept Krishna as the guru. Can't, you can't just say, well, he wants to accept what he's going to say. No, you, you don't know what he's going to say. Well, I mean, we don't, but of course Arjuna, he would know because he had already some relationship with Krishna. They'd been together. So he has he has confidence in Krishna. He has trust in Krishna. So he's coming to Krishna, and Arjuna himself, Arjuna's confused. So he doesn't know what to do, but he has confidence that Krishna is not confused. Krishna's to Krishna is quite clear. We just heard Krishna speaking a few verses earlier. He was telling Arjuna, give up this degrading impotence. It does not become you. Give up this weakness of heart, O chastiser of the enemy. And so Lord Krishna, he's not bewildered, he's not confused at all. Arjuna is confused, but Lord Krishna is not confused. 
So the guidance, you're going to be guided by some. you have to be guided by someone who can, who really knows what, to, what should be done. They're not confused. Often it happens, we have to make a decision, you will say, Oh, I don't know what I should do. I don't know. Will you tell me? So Arjuna is like that. He's come to Krishna. He's saying, I don't know what to do. But he's, he has firm faith and he, he, he's seen Lord Krishna speaking boldly and strongly. And Arjuna also knows that Krishna killed already this Madhu demon. So Arjuna is confident that Krishna can properly instruct him. Mm -hmm. Anyone else in this group? Like to say something? Lavanga, is it? You're Lavanga. Uh, Lavanya Prabhu. Lavanya? Yeah. Okay. That's initiated name, is it? Or? Uh, no, Prabhu, I'm not yet initiated. You're not yet initiated, okay. Lavanya. We have many devotees who use that name, Lavanga. Lavanya. It's a spiritual name. You've already got a spiritual name. Are your parents devotees? Uh, no, my parents are not. Only my mother. Uh -huh. Okay. All right. Any other Prabhus there like to say anything? Lakshmi Narayan? Sunanda Prabhu? Any comment? Uh, yes, Maharaj, uh, I am uh, very convinced and uh, satisfied of what, uh, what you answered. That uh, uh, by seeing the confidence and the straightforwardness and uh, boldness of Krishna, Arjuna uh, have the uh, faith, strong faith and trust in Krishna. Therefore, he is surrendered to Krishna. Yeah. So how can we apply this in our own Krishna consciousness? Uh, this is an example uh, which is uh, uh, cited in this uh, uh, Mahabharata war, that is uh, Bhagavad Gita, that uh, Krishna is all, always, uh, uh, he has always solution to the all problems. So he is uh, giving us the this trust that you should believe me that I can solve your all problems. So uh, in this way, uh, Krishna is uh, very confident and he is very uh, uh, well known to all our problems. Uh, in this way, we, we should also surrender to Krishna. That is our uh, uh, aim and that is also uh, taught in this uh, lesson. Okay. Yes. Very good. Thank you, Prabhu. Okay, Prabhu, we close the rooms now. Okay. We, we have a bun in a minute. Recording in progress. This meeting is being recorded. Yes, uh, Hare Krishna. Is everyone back in the main room? Yes, Maharaj, we're back. Okay. Uh, not all, Maharaj, only 19 are there. Oh, only 19. Okay, we'll just wait a few more seconds. <laughs> Give them a chance to come back. Did we close all the rooms, yeah? Yeah, it is, uh, it is automatic. Okay. Just need to wait for a few seconds. Okay.
Am I right? So, uh, let's hear from some group. But, but do, do we have some spokesman there for each group? There should be a spokesman. They can yes, tell yes, us well. something yes. what you discussed. So, so devotee, I, I request you to please raise the hand and then speak. Please don't unmute yourself and speak out. Let other devotees also to speak. Okay, let's hear. Is this a uh, what is it? Vidush? Yes, Vidush Prabhu. Yes, Vidush Prabhu. Uh, Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna. So I am the spokesperson from my group Maharaj. Uh -huh. Yeah. So uh, the first point was identify general principles drawn from Arjuna's dilemma and uh, surrender to Krishna. Maharaj, are you able to hear me properly? Yeah, just make it a bit clearer. Is this fine, Maharaj, now? Yes, better. Yes. Okay. So the first point was identify general principles drawn from Arjuna's dilemma and surrender to Krishna. So uh, we went through the purport and we could uh, churn out a few points out of it. Uh, first one being, uh, Prabhupada says uh, that more or less everybody in this material world is perplexed because the uh, structure of this material world is, is, uh, is such that everybody is confused. They are in a state of indecision, not knowing what to do and what not to do. So in this uh, state of perplexity, uh, one must, uh, Prabhupada clearly says, this is line number one, two, probably around 10th or 12th line. The Vedic wisdom therefore advises that in order to solve the perplexity of life and to understand the science of the solution, one must approach a spiritual master who is in the disciplic succession. This is a very important bullet point that uh, I could find, that one must approach a spiritual master. And then uh, further moving on in uh, para number two, Prabhaji states that uh, a miserly man who does not solve the problems of life as a human and who thus quits this world like cats and dogs without understanding the science of self-realization. So here, uh, uh, the definition, if this is Brahat Arangya Upanishad 3.8.10. Uh, this is the definition of a perplexed man. A perplexed man does not know what needs to be done, what does not need to be done. So he leaves his body uh, like cats and dogs. This is point number two. And then uh, further, uh, the definition of Kripana is given. Who is a Kripan? Kripan is somebody who is overly attached to his family, his wife, his children. And uh, he thinks that uh, to, towards the end of my life, they will be able to protect me. But uh, ultimately, that doesn't happen. So such family attachment, because it is already there in animals also, they also take care of their children. So uh, this is in contrast to the situation at hand. Arjuna was actually an intelligent person. So, he knew that all these things, all these family and relatives, they won't be able to save me towards my end. So, ultimately, he considered himself a fool. He realized that he, uh, all these things are beyond the control of his family. So, he surrendered very humbly to his uh, spiritual master and he accepted uh, Krishna as his guru. Uh, moving on, uh, Maharaj point number two was that how these principles are relevant in our own practice of Krishna consciousness. So unanimously all of us agreed on one point that uh, we must consider ourselves as fool and uh, we should surrender ourselves uh, uh, in, in the service of our Guru and ask him for help. With all humility we should consider uh, ourselves uh, fool and unintelligent and surrender on to the Guru. Uh -huh. This is pretty much it from okay. my side. Thank you. Thank you for your contribution. Uh, I would just want to question, you know, why would Arjuna accept Krishna as a guru? Because they were friends. But now Arjuna is asking Krishna to become the guru and Arju Krishna is the chariot driver for Arjuna. So isn't it almost like some big, big change in the role. Uh, can I speak? Yes, okay, Maharaj. Yes, Manjil, Maharaj. Uh, Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Uh, because he was knowing that he is the supreme personality of Godhead, and he is the best person who can uh, give me the knowledge. He is the most, uh, uh, what I can say, he is the most uh, renounced and 
Bhagwan. He is Bhagwan, and Bhagwan's knowledge is the most topmost knowledge, and he will be the best uh, spiritual master for him. Why do you say Arjuna knew Krishna was the supreme personality of God? Why do you say that? You know, Ar Ar Krishna is the chariot driver. Krishna and Arjuna is giving instructions to Krishna, telling him, bring my chariot in the middle of the battlefield, I want to see everybody here. And so, it doesn't appear like Arjuna knows Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Uh, Maharaj, uh, they were, uh, before they were already there as Nar Nara, so maybe from inside he was knowing that uh, uh, he is supreme god he is, he is nara and he is narayan krishna is narayan and they have already that mutual relationship in the previous uh, birth so uh, he is not showing to others he didn't show to others but he was knowing from inside what i feel that this is this would be the reason mm. <laughs> how do you know what arjuna is feeling inside <laughs> That's a big speculation, I think. Can I watch? Yes, go ahead, Prabhu. Maharaj, uh, Arjuna now understand because he's an intelligent man. Now, now he uh, inquires about a serious matter. Yeah, he knows that uh, uh, talk between friends because earlier he and Krishna was friends. So, talks between Krishna cannot be serious. So. He takes the role of a disciple, a student, so that Krishna can seriously instruct him, guide him in this serious matter of authenticity. Mm -hmm. Yes, but what, what's the reason for the change? You know, they're friends, but now one's going to become the teacher and the other's a student. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Uh, Arjuna, uh, being a Kshatriya, he understood that whenever there is a confusion, to get the proper direction, we always need to surrender. And at that time, Krishna was present and Krishna already understood his weakness and he intentionally uh, took the chariot in front of Bhishma and Guru So. Somewhere Krishna already knew that he is in a perplexed situation and he wanted to, uh, Arjuna to speak up. And Arjuna knew this that uh, to get rid of this perplexed situation, I need to first surrender to uh, Krishna as a disciple. Then only he would be able to clarify and direct me. Why did he surrender to Krishna? Why did, he... huh? Why did he pick Krishna? to surrender. He, you know, he already let Krishna drive his chariot, he's become his servant there, driving the chariot, but now he's telling him, become my teacher. It's a big change in the, the rasa. Yes? No, I, I'm not sure why Krishna... What I can think, because Krishna scolds him to... Uh, this raised hand was Prabhuji always there for uh, speaking as a group representative, right? Yeah. Yes, but no. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, because Krishna scolds him that why you are becoming weak and why uh, get up and fight. So, since Arjuna is in complete uh, indecision, he wants to know why he should. Oh. What happened? He wants. He wants final instruction from Krishna, and he will follow whatever Krishna suggests. So he wants to understand why he should fight. Maybe. Uh huh. Yes, he wants to understand from Krishna why he should fight. We could say also you we see that Lord Krishna was not confused. Arjuna was confused, but Ar Ar Lord Krishna wasn't having any confusion. There was no problem on his part. And he's chastising Arjuna. 
He's telling Arjuna, give up the weakness of heart. Arise, O chastiser of the enemy. So Arjuna can see that Lord Krishna is very composed, he's not bewildered. At the same time, somehow, Arjuna addresses Krishna as Madhusudan. Somehow he understood that Lord Krishna had killed the demon Madhu previously. So there is some indication <coughs> there is some indication there that Lord Krishna is aware, or rather Arjuna is aware of the divine position of Lord Krishna. And he's seeking Arjuna is seeking Krishna to become his guru and, and guide him. Arjuna and Krishna had a lasting friendship. There, as you, not only in this life, in previous lives also, they're together. Prabhupada told us, he said, wherever Krishna goes, Arjuna goes with him. Anyway, in this particular life, Lord Krishna and Arjuna had been friends, and they'd often been together, and they would often discuss philosophy. So, Arjuna was confident that he could get good instruction from Lord Krishna. He had confidence that he had faith in Krishna. Now that's a very important point, to have faith in the teacher. There's a statement, there's a verse, maybe you know it, yasya devi para bhakto yata devi tata guru, that you have to have equal faith in guru and in Krishna. Just as you have faith in Guru, you must have faith in Krishna, equal, because Guru is representative of Krishna. So you see Arjuna, he has, he has that faith in Lord Krishna, and therefore he's coming to Krishna and he's asking Krishna, please accept me as your disciple, please instruct me, because Arjuna admits, he said, I'm confused, and he understood the cause of his confusion miserly weakness. So this is, this is Arjuna's dilemma, he's in this condition, but he's fortunate that he can go to Krishna. Right? Hare Krishna, can yes. I speak one more? Yes, one go more ahead time. Madhuji, okay. Uh, in 11th chapter also, even Arjun was knowing from inside, from the right, from the beginning, because uh, when he saw the Virat uh, root, the uh, universal form of Krishna, even then also he said that all Rishis, many Rishis name he spoke, that Vyasa, all these are knowing that you are Supreme Personality of God. So he was knowing from inside. Arjuna was knowing from inside yes. that Krishna... Because he declared there that... Uh, many rishis already to, uh, declare that uh, you are Supreme Personality of Godhead. Yes, uh, the great sages, they, all, great sages. they also accept Krishna as the Supreme. Okay, yeah. Hare Krishna Maharaj, even one more point uh, I would like to um, give. Uh, Maharaj, it was like always, like whenever uh, our Pandavas used to be in trouble, Krishna, uh, Kunti Maharani used to uh, pray to Krishna and Krishna will always help them. So they knew that Krishna is their well wisher And since like many superiors are on the Adharma side and on the Dharma side, they used to take all guidance from Krishna. Even Yudhishthira Maharaj was taking the guide from Krishna. Maybe this can be the one more reason. Okay. The they, they, they take guidance from Krishna, they have trust in Krishna. Yes, that's, I think that's the same point which I've been saying, that they have that faith, they have that trust in Krishna. It's not like they're new to Krishna, it's like, not like they just met for the first time. You know, they have a long relationship together and they have, a, they have great trust. And, and remember, they're also aware of Lord Krishna his different childhood leela and his different pastimes, all the things which he's done. So they, they can understand something of the divine position of Lord Krishna. 
although Arjuna is enjoying the intimate association in friendship. So how do we apply this in our own Krishna consciousness then? Who would like to tell us? Mahendra Mahu. Hey Krishna Maharaj. Yeah, so Maharaj, what we have discussed that how we can apply, we can, uh, first of all, we can have our spiritual master. We can find a guru so that uh, we, you know, from the uh, success and, and we can have, we can, fully surrender ourselves into the Guru and whatever Guru says, we should follow uh, the path. So in that way we can, uh, you know, have uh, our uh, services unto Guru and uh, it can be helpful to us. Yes, okay, good. Yes, we have to accept a spiritual teacher and that spiritual teacher should be in the line of Krishna, coming from Krishna, a representative of Lord Krishna. And he should help us to overcome all the miserly weaknesses which we may have. The attachment for our material conditions, our bodily affections. Spiritual teacher should help us to cut these attachments, to get free of them. Yes. Prahlad, Prabhu, anything to comment? Uh, yes, Maharaj. So, um, I mean, I'm supposed to answer the second part of the question. I think Manjuri Mataji already answered the first part. Um, so, uh, these uh, principles, Arjuna was like, um, in the, in the upper part of the Bhagavad Gita, um, so that verse, text 7, uh, it said that Arjuna faced uh, perplexities and Prabhupada said it's normal for us to face perplexities in life. So, like, for myself, I also face problems every day, you know, I get confused. And um, these are, uh, Prabhupada said it's like a fire, a forest fire, and we don't want a forest fire to happen, but it happens. We cannot do anything about it. So we must know how to handle it, you know, how, so how to um, douse the fire and all. So um, that's why we must approach a spiritual master. And uh, it's, it's important to approach a spiritual master from the disciplic succession so that we will get the correct message. Otherwise, uh, you, you know, we'll be misled even more. That spiritual master, you know, who's not from the disciplic succession, he will be uh, uh, speaking to us for his own interests, for his own gains. So it's not sincere, so the message won't come across very nicely. Uh, and we'll be confused even more. Also, um, every day we, we are also very attached to our family. I'm very attached to my family and all. And um, so we, sometimes I get confused. Should I uh, prioritize in my devotional life first? Or should I you know, um, tend to my family duties? Or, you know, should I serve my mother, serve my father first? Which should I do? And um, also, every day I have like various desires. So sometimes, Prabhupada said we shouldn't eat prasadam, but sometimes I want to eat in certain restaurants, eat, eat, eat certain uh, types of foods in, in uh, certain restaurants, or, you know, do certain things that, um, you know, it's best not to do. I, I could do better things with my time. So, uh, and then I give justification for myself. So, um, like eating in restaurants, for example, like um, many, I've heard this before, many people say, uh, Srila Prabhupada, he once, he went to, a, to someone's house to preach to them and uh, he was given food and in the food there was onion and garlic and Prabhupada just uh, removed the onion and garlic and he ate the food and uh, I've seen people, they use that as their justification, so I was like, okay, it's alright if once in a while we also go to such restaurants, uh, but um, I, I was also told that, you know, Prabhupada said, you must try to restrain yourself, especially when you have the, you know, when you have, if you're able to restrain yourself, then you should. So like this, I face many um, problems and I give justifications for myself. So somehow I try to tell myself it's okay. So that's why I should go to a spiritual master and ask the spiritual master so he will tell me directly whether it's... Okay. Uh, Spiritual master will tell you, don't eat in the restaurants, right? Prabhupada told us, 
I remember here in Mayapur, Prabhupada told us so many devotees had come from the West and they were all thinking to go to the restaurants and Prabhupada said, don't eat in the restaurants. So we don't like devotees to go and eat in restaurants. It's not our business as devotees. When we put on the sign of devotee, neck beads and so on, we don't belong in restaurants to eat. Okay, any final points before we go on? Anybody else like to add? Yes? For the second point, we discussed that um, sometimes mother, uh, uh, wife can be uh, devoted. Uh, the husband is not a devotee, so that is one of the perplexities uh, one, uh, one person brought up. Um, another point also that at the age of Vanaprastha, people are too attached to uh, uh, the family and they are not able to detach and engage in Krishna consciousness. So that could be another uh, real life uh, example of per perplexity. Oh, there are endless perplexities. We don't have any problem to find perplexities. There's always so many things to cause us problems in the material world. <laughs> yes. All right, anything else? Uh, Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Yes, Mariji. Yes, please. Uh, in the first part, uh, the general prince was drawn from uh, Arjuna's dilemma in Pakhpat. 8, because we can choose from 6 to 11, so Purport 8 itself it says that old age, birth, disease and death cannot be encountered by accumulation of birth and economic development only by surrendering to uh, spiritual master and uh, following Krishna consciousness in our life. So that is there in 8, uh, that we learn from this. and. Uh, in the last, in the eighth purport only, when the results of the pious activities are fin finished, then uh, one falls down again in the, uh, from the peak of the happiness. So the su supreme happiness is to in Krishna consciousness only. So that also we learn the principle from. Okay. Uh, yes. Maharaj, Prabhupada said. Thank you, Maharaj. Confusion and the frustration with the materialistic way of life is the only qualification to come to Krishna consciousness. So this material world is the full of darkness. Like if a person is deceased, he has to approach a doctor. doctor. This material world is full of misery, confusion and a lot of doubts arises. So the necessity is that to approach a bona fide a spiritual master and like to sit in the shloka or mechanical in the shape so that uh, we can I'm not this, uh, okay. Yes, right, fine. Okay, thank you. We'll go ahead. Let's see here. This Dharma Samuda. What is the meaning, Dharma Samuda? Who remembers? Dharma Samuda means? Yes, right. All right. Someone can. Oh, we did this. Okay. Someone can read. Tarpanya means one who does not properly use his position. One man is very rich, but he does not use his money. Simply sees the money. He is called Kripan. Similarly, Arjuna is powerful. He can fight. He is Kshatri, but he is denying his ability. Hmm. Okay. So the man is rich, he does not use his money. I don't think he can have a wife, must have no wife. If the wife is there, she would use the money, I'm sure. And so this is Kripana. Arjuna is powerful, he can fight, but he is denying his ability. Go ahead. Therefore he is thinking that I have become Kripan myself. Although I have got strength, I am denying to fight, although I have got money. I do not spend. These are called Kripan. So Kripan Dosh Pata. Now I am infected with Kripan Dosha. Kripan Dosha. Yes. Kripan Dosha. Pahata Swabhava. Now I am infected with this miserly weakness, this fault of miserly weakness. Not wanting to use abilities. Pro go ahead. Read next one. Someone. Arjuna. Okay, go ahead, Mariji. 
Arjuna argued religious principles should be given more importance than politics or sociology. But he did not know that knowledge of matter, soul and the supreme is even more important than the religious formula. Ah. <coughs> so Arjuna was thinking about religious principles. He was thinking about dharma. Oh yes, we should be religious, should be pious. He was thinking that's more important than politics and sociology. But Prabhupada said there's something more important than just material religion. And more important than material religion is knowledge of the Supreme and the relationship with the individual. All right? So, the objectives we covered today, what have we spoke about? We explained the principles of Varnashrama Dharma, right? We've def def we gave the definition and explanation about Varnashram, organizing society according to every individual's psychophysical nature, not based on birth, but based on work and uh, qualities. And then the modes influencing the Varnas, how the Brahman is expected to be the mode of goodness. One who wants to come to the Brahminical platform, he should cultivate the mode of goodness. He should stay away from the passion and ignorance. And specific duties of the Varnas and Ashrams, according to our different Ashrams and Varnas, there are different duties. Just like Brahmachari Ashram, the Brahmachari Ashram, their duty is to serve the spiritual teacher and they will go out and beg alms and whatever they receive they'll bring back and give to the Guru. That's the very beginning of Mahabharat, like that, how they're serving their Guru and giving everything for the Guru. So different varnas and ashrams, different duties are there. And then the results of following varnashram, people will be elevated, you'll get a better future life. Now, uh, we related Arjuna's reasons for not fighting to the principles of varnashram dharma. Oh, we, we didn't actually spend time on that, but we can look at it now. Arjuna's reasons for not fighting according to the principles of Varnashram Dharma. Just like the first reason Arjuna had for not fighting was compassion. So how does this apply to the principles of Varnashram Dharma? Who is expected to be compassionate? Hare Krishna. Uh, no, Prabhu, sorry, my hand was uh, raised already. Uh, Mukesh Prabhu, would you like to give the answer? Prabhu, so, uh, that was for another question. I wanted to ask a question. So. Well, yes, can you answer, Maharaji, please? Yeah, Brahmanas have to be more compassionate. Right, that's right. Is Arjuna a Brahmana? He's a Kshatriya. Right. So Arjuna was taking, he was not acting according to his position in Varnashram. When he was talking about compassion, he was not acting according to that position. And so it was not appropriate. He was speaking about compassion. But that's not his duty as a Kshatriya. So that was against the principles of Varnashram. And then Arjuna's second reason for not fighting? Enjoyment. Right? Is that according to Varnashram Dharma? Yes, Hare Krishna Maharaj. I'm not sure if it is correct. Um, he he was uh, not a sannyasi, so at his disposal, uh, he had everything to enjoy. Hmm. 
Yes. Yes, I mean, they're supposed to give up everything. Yeah, later on we will hear that uh, Arjuna, that if he fights, he will enjoy. If he wins, what will happen? If he wins the battle, then he will enjoy the kingdom. And if he loses the battle, and he goes on the battlefield and he loses the battle, he, that means he will die on the battlefield, will he enjoy? Um, he will not enjoy, but he will be going to heavenly planets where he will go and enjoy. Yes, that's right. He will enjoy. He will, in the next life he will enjoy. If he dies on the battlefield, next life he will enjoy. So if he wins or loses, both ways he will enjoy. But if he doesn't fight, then he won't enjoy. And then third, he was worried about sinful reactions. Arjuna's reason for not fighting, worried about sinful reactions. Is this according to Vanashram? Well, he's a Kshatriya. And Kshatriyas are meant to fight. He shouldn't be worrying about sinful reactions. Rather, if he doesn't do his duty, that's sinful. So by doing his duty, he won't get sinful reactions. But if he doesn't perform his duty, then he will get sinful reaction. And then he was worried about the destruction of the dynasty. So the destruction of the dynasty will come about if he doesn't fight because he's showing a bad example. It's important for Arjuna to show the right example. Varnashram, as a, as a Kshatriya, he's meant to per show, his, show his proper duty, perform his duty according to the nature of Kshatriyas. He can't just say, oh, I'm not going to fight. So he should act according to his principle, the position in Varnashram. All right. So according to Varnashram, Arjuna was not properly based. His reasons for fighting. Okay, then arguments to defeat the concept of Varna determined by birth. Arguments to defeat the concept of Varna. In other words, someone may say, I'm a Brahmana. My father is a Brahmana, so I'm a Brahmana. How will you argue against that? Someone can give an argument? Yes, Ramani, Maharaj, it is not according to birth. It is according to Guna uh, and Karma. So give an example to defeat. Um, uh, Vishwa, Vashishta, Vishwamitra was, uh, uh, was born as a uh, uh, Kshatriya, but later uh, he, uh, according to his uh, 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 guna, he became a, a Brahmana, Brahma Rishi. So? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Uh, a doctor's son cannot become a doctor. He needs to study all the uh, things required to become a doctor. Also, same a lawyer's son cannot be a lawyer. He needs to learn law. Thank you, Prabhu. That's right. Yes. The birth alone is not enough. Uh huh. Okay. And then personal application. We spoke about Arjuna's dilemma and surrender to Krishna and the general principles. Arjuna was confused about his duty. He needed guidance from someone. And so he surrendered to Lord Krishna because he had faith and confidence and trust in Lord Krishna. And he understood that by taking guidance from Krishna, he could conquer over his illusion and his miserly weakness. So in our own practice of Krishna consciousness, it's important that we have to be convinced. As Srila Prabhupada would say, try to hear from your spiritual teacher for at least a year, and then you should be convinced that this person can save me, he can change me. 
We have to have that faith and trust. It's very important. And then we can be properly guided. Okay, here's a final quote. Father and teacher is advised by Chanakya Pandit that you should always chastise your son and disciple. Always find out mistake. Don't be angry, but it is the business of the teacher and the father simply to find out your mistakes, not to find out your good things. Never recognize the disciple's business or son's business as very good. Then they will spoil. That is the injunction of Chanakya Muni. So, so far we are concerned. When our spiritual master used to chastise, we took it as blessing. That was very nice. And he would chastise like anything. Damn rascal, foolish, stupid, anything. All good words. From Srimad Bhagavatam 294, from a lecture in Japan, 1972. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Are there any questions? Hare Krishna Maharaj, I just want to give the example uh, of that Brahmana's, uh, one person born in the Brahmana family like Jagai Madhai. Jagai Madhai were born in the Brahmana family but they were not having the qualities of a Brahmana. Yes, right. That's a good example. Jagai and Madhai had been born in Brahmana families but they became degraded. They didn't have any Brahminical qualities. Yes? Not only Jagai and Madhai, I think Ravan was also born in Brahmana family. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes. Uh, even Ashwasthama, Dronacharya's son. Yes. He was also a Brahmana but had demoniac qualities. Yes. Well, why do you say he had demoniac qualities? Because he killed uh, the sleeping sons of Pandavas. But, yes, but at the same time, he was in a... You remember what happened to his father? He was very disturbed by the death of his father. He felt that his father had been unfairly killed. So he felt very angry about that, the, the way, the manner in which his father left the world. So he had, you know, a lot of pain in his heart because of the situation. But he's one of the Amaras. Ashwatthama is one of the Amaras. And at the end of Kali Yuga, he comes back, he has a, another birth. In the Satya Yuga. Thank you, Maharaj. Uh -huh. Maharaj, Prahlad Maharaj was also born in the, you know, demonic uh, succession, but uh, with bhakti he became the great god. Uh, right, yes, Prahlad is born in the family of the demons, but he has great devotion for the Lord. Yes. Yeah. Yes, right, many. And Srila Prabhupada also is not from a Brahmana family. Srila Prabhupada is not Brahman. And I don't think Bhaktivinoda Thakur, Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati, they're not from Brahman family. But they're great devotees. And so the birth, is, but the the birth can be a, it can be an advantage. It's not an obstacle. Yes. Any other points? Uh, Hari Hari Muslim family. Yes. Yes. 
Yes, anybody else? Any other question or comment? I have a question, Mara. Yes, Guru. Uh, yes. So, so the duty, the paro dharma or swadharma of a Brahman, of a Brahmachari or a sannyasi is to preach the holy name. So, a Goshtanandi, he he does not want to preach. So, is that karpanya in this case? Goshtanandi will preach. The Bhajananandi won't preach, but the ghost of Sorry, Anandi, I'm, yeah, I mixed it up. Sorry, Bajna, yeah. I, So, in the case of a Bhajananandi, is it Karpanya? Well, it's just a, a different position. You know, he's taking that position as Bhajananandi. He's taking the, the the holy name. He's serving the holy name. We wouldn't say it's a fault, but it may not be our mood, it may not be the mood of our acharyas, but you know, if, if he's faithfully chanting the holy name, it's not a fault. You know, we can't really criticize someone because, you know, Haridas Thakur was also chanting the holy name. Haridas Thakur is Nam Acharya. So, you know, chanting the holy name, that is actually the that's it, the perfection of life, to just sit and chant the holy name. So we can't say it's a fault. Mm -hmm. So once, uh, once, uh, one completely Krishna conscious, pure devotional service, then he goes beyond all the rules and regulations, right? Varnashrama also, yes. if he's... Yes, if you're Krishna my, conscious. My, my, my point is, Maharaj, that a, a, a elevated devotee cannot consider himself purified. So he does not consider himself. So it could come, this thought could cross his mind that maybe I am in Maya because I am not preaching, but I, I am also taking the mood that I will chant the holy name. So because there is no clear distinction that he will preach or he will chant the holy name. So even within Krishna consciousness, there, is, there are sometimes you cannot figure out, am I being uh, you know selfish? by just sitting and chanting the holy name or am I not going out and you, am I, I think I, I'm trying to explain like what, what is yes. that? Well, uh, you have to consider what is the desire of the spiritual master, but somebody who has actually taken initiation into the Babaji order of life generally would come at the end of life. We see people like Bhaktivinoda Thakur, and Baladeva Vijabhusan, they took the, uh, the Babaji initiation and they just sat and chanted the holy name at the end of life. So, hmm, it's, it's, it's possible. And Prabhupada also told us, Prabhupada said, if you use your life uh, while you're young, you travel and preach Krishna consciousness, then at the end of life, you can come and sit down in a holy place and read the books of the Goswami. Okay. So, according to, you know, time and circumstances, what is our position, are we at the end of life, you know, then it's time to sit down and chant the holy name and just absorb ourselves in the holy name. Yes? It's not a fault. That is the perfection, that you can take full shelter of the holy name. And people need to see that example also, and because everyone else gets so caught up in doing other things, they have no time to chant the holy name. So they need to see the example, how others can sit down and chant the holy name. Uh-huh. Okay, thank you for that question. Any other final question or comment? Okay, then we'll finish here and we'll meet you. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Thank you. I have to do my class. Okay. Hare Krishna Maharaj. I'm just seeking a little more clarification on the Avarnashram division of duties, that is, occupational duties and prescribed duties. Can you just elaborate a little on that? Occupational, <laughs> occupational duties, well, according to our varna our occupation, right? 
We have the, the, Shat, the Brahman, the Kshatriya, the Vaishya Sudra. Their occupational duties are different. The Brahman's occupation to worship the deity and to teach others to worship the deity and to study the scriptures and to teach the scriptures. And the Brahmana can also accept charity and give charity. So these are the occupational duties of the Brahmana. Now Kshatriya will be a bit different, right? Kshatriya is more administrative, managerial, according to the different qualities of the Kshatriya. The occupational duties are there. Now prescribed duties, that will be according to his situation in the ashram, just like you Grihastha. You have a family, you have to take care of your family cannot be irresponsible. You have a wife, you have children, you have to take care of them. Sometimes your duty is towards the parents, take care of the parents. And so these different uh, responsibilities are there. There's occupational duties and prescribed duties. All right? Maharaj, for example, if somebody is a, you know, Brahman and there is a threat to, you know, his family or something, and he might have to, you know, pick up a weapon and protect his family. So will that be considered as the, uh, you know, prescribed duty? To pick up a weapon to protect his family? <laughs> yes, well, maybe, yes. If the family is being threatened, a life-threatening situation, and then certainly we could say like that, yeah. Okay. Uh, Hare Krishna Maharaj, I have a question. Uh, I just wanted to know the level of progress between uh, the Grahastha and the full-time devotees like Brahmacharis and uh, Sannyasis. What will be the level between them? Will like if you see like Grahastha, he is not completely indulged or involved in Krishna consciousness. Even though he is working, even though he thinks that he is working for the sake of the Lord, but uh, what will be the level? Will he progress slowly, or the people uh, like uh, the sannyasis, brahmacharis, who are um, completely indulged in Krishna consciousness, will they uh, progress fast? So how will that, Maharaj? Can well, just... there's no. You, it's not hard and fast. We cannot say that because one is brahmachari and sannyasi, he will make more progress. Sometimes we see Grihastas also make very good progress. You know, Grihastas in family life, they can also progress very nicely because they're taking on so many responsibilities in the service of Krishna. And they're showing the example to others in how to utilize their ashram in the service of Krishna. So it's not an obstacle. We see the Mahajans, many of the Mahajans are also Grihastas. Hmm. Swayambhu, Narada, Shambhu, Kumar, Kapalo. You go through them all, you see more than half are Grihastas. So Mahajans, great devotees, they're also Grihastas. Lord Krishna. Uh, Maharaj, uh, Maharaj but they all are liberated souls already. But, uh, what will be the people who are fallen or the uh, how could uh, they will be able to handle the situation like being Grahastha, Krishna conscious and all? Well, sometimes brahmacharis and sannyasis also become fallen. Don't think because they're brahmacharis and sannyasis that they don't become fallen. They can also have spiritual difficulties. So don't just be critical of Grihastas. And not all Grihastas are fallen. And they may be fallen, but they can become saintly, they can become changed, they can be transformed by the power of Krishna consciousness. Okay? Hare Krishna Maharaj, I'm very sorry to take your time. Um, I have one last question. So um, just now um, we learned that Ramana is supposed to be peaceful, uh, you know, com he, he should have compassion. But um, in, we see uh, great personalities like Dronacharya fighting. So I thought Dronacharya as a Brahmana, why is he 
why is Paisi fighting in the battle of Kurukshetra? Well, he was obliged to fight. He gave up his Brahminical position to fight. He was obliged. He'd taken shelter in the palace. He'd come there to Astinapur to take shelter. So they were maintaining him. So he was obliged to come into the battle to fight. Obligations were there. And so he, can't, he could not just simply say, oh, I'm Brahmana. No. He'd already taught everything to the Kauravas and the Pandavas, and then he had defeated, he sent them to defeat Maharaj Drupada, and they took half of the kingdom of Maharaj Drupada. And so Drupada was the enemy, the sworn enemy of Drona, and Dronacharya knew that Drupada had performed a sacrifice to get a son who was going to kill him. So Drona knew all of this. So Drona knows he has, he has to fight. He cannot just say, no, no, I'm not going to fight. He's not cowardly. He had to go in the battle. He was obliged to fight. Okay? Maharaj, yes. can that be seen as a prescribed duty? The huh? Dronachar example which you gave just now, uh -huh. prescribed duty. Uh -huh. Can that be seen as? Yes, you could say that, prescribed duty, yeah. Okay. Maharaj. Yes. Maharaj. Maharaj, is transmigration of foreigners is desirable? Transmigration of varna is desirable. Is it desirable? Well, you you have to be transcendental in order to move to another. You have to be transcendentally situated. It's not for ordinary people. You have to be really transcendental to change your varna. The people who change their varna, like Vishwamitra and uh, who's the other example? Uh, Parasurama, you know, they changed their varna. They were transcendental, they were not ordinary souls. Okay, any other question? No, Maharaj. All right, so we'll stop here. We'll see you tomorrow afternoon, 3 o'clock. Recording stopped. Hare Krishna. Shura the recording Prabhu has stopped. Shura Prabhupada Ki Jai. <laughs>